Dear Esther, the gulls do not land here anymore. I've noticed that this year they seem to shun the place. Maybe it's the depletion of the fishing stock driving them away. Perhaps it's me. When he first landed here, Donnelly wrote that the herds were sickly and their shepherds the lowest of the miserable classes that populate these Hebridean islands. 300 years later, even they have departed. Donnelly reported the legend of the Hermit, a holy man who sought solitude in its most pure form. Allegedly, he rode here from the mainland in a boat without a bottom, so all the creatures of the sea could rise at night to converse with him. How disappointed he must have been with their chatter. Perhaps now, when all that haunts the ocean is the rubbish dumped from the tankers, he'd find more peace. They say he threw his arms wide in a valley on the south side and the cliff opened up to provide him shelter. They say he died of fever 116 years later. The shepherds left gifts for him at the mouth of the cave, but Donnelly records they never claimed to have seen him. I have visited the cave and I have left my gifts, but like them, I appear to be an unworthy subject of his solitude. When you were born, your mother told me, a hush fell over the delivery room. A great red birthmark covered the left side of your face. No one knew what to say, so you cried to fill the vacuum. I always admired you for that, that you cried to fill whatever vacuum you found. I began to manufacture vacuums just to enable you to deploy your talent. The birthmark faded by the time you were six and had gone completely by the time we met, but your fascination with the empty and its cure remained. Donnelly's book had not been taken out from the library since 1974. I decided it would never be missed as I slipped it under my coat and avoided the librarian's gaze on the way out. If the subject matter is obscure, the writer's literary style is even more so. It is not the text of a stable or trustworthy reporter. Perhaps it is fitting that my only companion in these last days should be a stolen book written by a dying man. When someone had died or was dying, or was so ill they gave up what little hope they could sacrifice, they cut parallel lines into the cliff, exposing the white chalk beneath. You could see them from the mainland or the fishing boat, and know to send aid or impose a cordon of protection, and wait a generation until whatever pestilence stalked the cliff paths died along with its hosts. My lines are just for this. 
to keep any would-be rescuers at bay. The infection is not simply of the flesh. They were God-fearing people, those shepherds. There was no love in the relationship. Donnelly tells me that they had one Bible that was passed around in strict rotation. It was stolen by a visiting monk in 1776, two years before the island was abandoned altogether. In the interim, I wonder, did they assign chapter and verse to the stones and grasses, marking the geography with a superimposed significance that they could actually walk the Bible and inhabit its contradiction? Dear Esther, I met Paul. I made my own little pilgrimage. My Damascus, a small semi-detached on the outskirts of Wolverhampton. We drank coffee in his kitchen and tried to connect to one another. Although he knew I hadn't come in search of an apology, reason or retribution, he still spiralled in panic, thrown high and lucid by his own dented bonnet. Responsibility had made him old. Like us, he'd already passed beyond any conceivable boundary of life. I would leave you presents outside your retreat in this interim space between cliff and beach. I would leave you loaves and fishes, but the fish stocks have been depleted and I've run out of bread. I would row you back to your homeland in a bottomless boat, but I fear we would both be driven mad by the chatter of the sea creatures. He still maintains he wasn't drunk, but tired. I can't make the judgment or the distinction anymore. I was drunk when I landed here, and tired too. I walked up the cliff path in near darkness and camped in the bay where the trawler lies beached. It was only at dawn that I saw the bothy and decided to make my temporary lodgings there. I was expecting just the aerial and a transmitter stashed in a weatherproof box somewhere on the mount. It had an air of uneasy permanence to it. Like all the other buildings here, erosion seems to have evaded it completely.
Dear Esther, I have now driven the stretch of the M5 between Exeter and Bristol over 21 times. But although I have all the reports and all the witnesses and have cross-referenced them within a millimetre using my ordnance survey maps, I simply cannot find the location. You'd think there would be marks to serve as some evidence. It's somewhere between the turn-off for Sanford and the welcome brake services. But although I can always see it in my rearview mirror, I have as yet been unable to pull ashore. There must be a hole in the bottom of the boat. How else could new hermits have arrived? I had kidney stones and you visited me in the hospital. After the operation, when I was still half submerged in anaesthetic, your outline and your speech both blurred. Now my stones have grown into an island and made their escape, and you have been rendered opaque by the car of a drunk. All night the boy has kept me lucid. I sat when I was at the very edge of despair, when I thought I would never unlock the secret of the island. I sat at the edge and I watched the idiot boy blink through the night. He is mute and he is retarded and he has no thought in his metal head but to blink each wave and each minute aside until the morning comes and renders him blind as well as deaf mute. In many ways we have much in common.
I've begun my ascent on the windless slope of the western side. The setting sun was an inflamed eye squeezing shut against the light shone in by the doctors. My neck is aching through constantly craning my head up to track the light of the aerial. I must look downwards, follow the path under the island to a new beginning. Bothy was constructed originally in the early 1700s. By then, shepherding had formalized into a career. The first habitual shepherd was a man called Jacobson from a lineage of migratory Scandinavians. He was not considered a man of breeding by the mainlanders. He came here every summer whilst building the Bothy, hoping eventually that becoming a man of property would secure him a wife and a lineage. Donnelly records that it did not. He caught some disease from his malcontented goats and died two years after completing it. There was no one to carve white lines into the cliff for him either. They found Jakobsen in early spring. The thaw had only just come. Even though he'd been dead nearly seven months, his body had been frozen right down to the nerves and had not even begun to decompose. His fingernails were raw and bitten to the quick. They found the phosphorescent moss that grows in the caves deep under the nails. Whatever he'd been doing under the island when his strength began to fail is lost. He'd struggled halfway up the cliff again, perhaps in a delirium perhaps trying to reach the Bothy's fire before curling into a stone and expiring. Climbing down to the caves, I slipped and fell and have injured my leg. I think the femur is broken. It is clearly infected. The skin has turned a bright, tight pink, and the pain is crashing in on waves, winter tides against my shoreline, drowning out the ache of my stones. I struggled back to the bothy to rest, but it has become clear that there is only one way this is likely to end. The medical supplies I looted from the trawler have suddenly found their purpose. They will keep me lucid for my final ascent.
Donnelly's addiction is my one true constant. Even though I wake in false dawns and find the landscape changing and flowing in constantly through my tears, I know his reaching is always upon me. There is no other direction, no other exit from this motorway. Speeding past this junction, I saw you waiting at the roadside, a one last drink in your trembled hands.
I am traveling through my own body, following the line of infection from the shattered femur towards the heart. I swallow fistfuls of painkillers to stay lucid. In my delirium, I see the twin lights of the moon in the area shining to me through the rocks. This is a drowned man's face, reflected in the moonlit waters. It can only be a dead shepherd who has come to drunk drive you home.
I wish I could have known Donnelly in this place. We would have had so much to debate. Did he paint these stones or did I? Who left the pots in the hut by the jetty? Who formed the museum under the sea? Who fell silently to his death into the frozen waters? Who erected this godforsaken aerial in the first place? Did this whole island rise to the surface of my stomach, forcing the gulls to take flight? Fire and soil, I chose fire. It seemed the more contemporary of the options, the more sanitary. I could not bear the thought of the reassembly of such a room. Stitching arm to shoulder and femur to hip, charting a line of thread like traffic stilled on a motorway, making it all acceptable for tearful aunts and traumatized uncles flown in specially for the occasion. Reduce to ash, mix with water, make a phosphorescent paint for these rocks and ceilings. There were chemical diagrams on the mug he gave me coffee in, sticky at the handle where his hands shook. He worked for a pharmaceutical company with an office based on the outskirts of Wolverhampton. He'd been travelling back from a sales conference in Exeter, forming a strategic vision for the peddling of antacid yoghurt to the European market. You could trace the connections with your finger, join the dots, and whole new compounds would be summoned into activity. From here, I can see my armada. I collected all the letters I'd ever meant to send to you, if I'd have ever made it to the mainland, but had instead collected at the bottom of my rucksack, and I spread them out along the lost beach. Then I took each and every one, and I folded them into boats. I folded you into the creases, and then, as the sun was setting, I set the fleet to sail. Shattered into 21 pieces, I consigned you to the Atlantic, and I sat here until I'd watched all of you sink.
a sound of torn metal, teeth running over the edge of the rocks, a moon that casts a signal as I lay pinned beside you, the ticking of the cooling engine, and the calling from a great height, all my mind as a bypass. I've begun my voyage in a paper boat without a bottom. I will fly to the moon in it. I've been folded along a crease in time, a weakness in the sheet of life. Now you've settled on the opposite side of the paper to me. You can see your traces in the ink that soaks through the fiber, the pulped vegetation. When we become waterlogged and the cage disintegrates, we will intermingle. When this paper aeroplane leaves the cliff edge and carves parallel vapor trails in the dark, we will come together. If only Donnelly had experienced this, he would have realized he was his own shoreline, as am I. Just as I am becoming this island, so he became his syphilis, retreating into the burning synapses, the stones, the infection. The stones in my stomach will weigh me down and ensure my descent is true and straight. I will break through the fog of these godforsaken pills and achieve clarity. All my functions are clogged, all my veins are choked. If my leg doesn't rot off before I reach the summit, it will be a miracle. There are 21 connections in the circuit diagram of the anti-lock brakes. There are 21 species of gull inhabiting these islands. It is 21 miles between the Sanford Junction and the turn-off for home. All these things cannot, will not be a coincidence. A gull perched on a spent bonnet, sideways, whilst the sirens fell through the middle distance and the metal moaned in grief about us. I'm about this night in walking, 
Old Brad and Gulbones. Old Donnelly at the bar gripping his drink. Old Esther walking with our children. Old Paul as ever. Old Paul. He shakes and he shivers and he turns off his lights alone. We will leave twin vapor trails in the air, white lines etched into these rocks. Dear Esther, I have burnt my belongings, my books, this death certificate. Mine will be written all across this island. Who was Jacobson? Who remembers him? Donnelly has written of him, but who was Donnelly? Who remembers him? I have painted, carved, hewn, scored into this space all that I could draw from him. There will be another to these shores to remember me. I will rise from the ocean like an island without bottom, come together like a stone, become an aerial, a beacon, that they will not forget you. We have always been drawn here. One day the gulls will return and nest in our bones and our history. I will look to my left and see Esther Donnelly flying beside me. I will look to my right and see Paul Jacobson flying beside me. They will leave white lines carved into the air to reach the mainland, where help will be sent. Come back.